started. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming to the June Be Calm Plant Forum. This is our final one in the Plant Treasures series hosted with the ANPC. So um, just some general housekeeping. If you're not speaking, please uh, mute yourself. There'll be opportunity at the end of the three talks to ask questions. So add them in the chat or, or write them down if you want to ask them. Uh, at the end, and I will hand over to Amelia. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, I'm just going to start um, sharing a few slides uh, from beginning here um, to welcome everyone. Just taking a minute to do that. OK. Yep. Can you see this all well? Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where I live and work, the Darug and the Darawal people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We're really fortunate today to have presentations from three very experienced scientists who've spent a lot of time testing seeds in their careers, and they're going to give you some guidance so you can better understand and plan seed testing for your collections. So we're going to start with Dr. Lucy Commander, who's the pro who was the project manager and publication editor of the Flora Bank guidelines, which were released last year, and also the translocation guidelines released in 2018 by the ANPC. She's now the research manage uh, management officer in the National Environmental Science Program Resilient Landscapes Hub at the University of Western Australia. Lucy's got a particular interest in that regeneration niche asking why seeds germinate, when and where they do, and how we can mimic those, ecosy those conditions to improve landscape management and ecosystem resilience. Next, we have Dr. Megan Hurst, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Seed Science at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria and Deakin University. Uh, day to day, she works in the Victorian Conservation Seed Bank at the National Herbarium of Victoria. Meg investigates the seed biology of Victorian native species with a focus on alpine ecology and aims to better characterise germination and the processes governing seed dormancy on a species specific basis. Finally, we have a presentation put together by Dr Gemma Hoyle, who is a seed scientist at the National Seed Bank in the Australian National Botanic Gardens, Canberra. Her research focuses on uncovering germination requirements and alleviating dormancy to improve the management and conservation of Australia's native flora. And her work is being presented today by Dr Lydia Guja, who's a member of the Germplasm Guidelines Steering Committee. Lydia is manage, manager of the National Seed Bank at the Australian National Botanic Gardens and a seed conservation biologist at the Centre for the Australian National Biodiversity Research, which is a joint venture between CSRO and Parks Australia. Okay, and so today we will be presenting information from both the Flora Bank and the Germplasm Guidelines because there's information relevant to seed testing in both of those. Lucy's going to talk about the Flora Bank guidelines and focus on the steps of seed testing, and Meg will continue by outlining content in the germplasm guidelines. And then Lydia is going to give us um, a case study about applying seed testing protocols in the ANVG lab. It's important to note that we all store and use seeds in a variety of different ways for different purposes. So as we go through these presentations, have a think about how and why your organisation stores seeds and what you want to find out when you test those seeds. Um, this is a table from Chapter 5 of the Germplasm Guidelines, looking at the storage conditions for seeds banked for different purposes. So we might be storing seeds in the short term with the intention of using them fairly quickly in restoration. There might be um, high turnover in those situations. We might be storing seeds for the medium term, perhaps for creating seed production areas or for plant breeding, or we might be aiming to store seeds for the long term as insurance collections to conserve wild species or crop species. So each of these um, situations influences how and when we test seeds. And I'd like to thank the Ian Potter Foundation for funding the germplasm guidelines revision and outreach activities such as these, and really acknowledge Begans and particularly Emma and Rebecca for their support in co-presenting this webinar series. Thanks so much. I hand over to, um, to Lucy now. Oh, thanks very much, Amelia, for that kind introduction. Um, I'll just get my slides up on screen. Can I just check that you can see the... Yep, good list. Yep, not the presenter either. 
Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thanks very much for the introduction. So I'm on um, Wajak Noongar Bujar today in Perth, Western Australia. Um, probably not quite so sunny as my background picture today. Um, so I'm just going to give you an introduction to seed testing based on some of the content in the recent update to the Flora Bank guidelines. Um, now in this talk, I'm going to explain about what seed testing is, um, why we should test seeds and how to test them. Now seed testing is one of the processes in seed supply chain, um, as you can see here. So the supply chain sort of starts with selecting species and collection locations, um, then moves through to seed collecting, possibly increase through production areas, um, processing, testing, drying and storage, possibly testing again, um, nursery crop seeding, um, and then planting through to adaptive management as well. Now, I'm sure many people on the line today will be quite familiar with the basics of seed testing, but listen up because the Flora Bank Guidelines is an amazing resource for people who are actually quite familiar with this content, but want to provide training materials to others as well. So seed testing um, is um, seed quality testing involves assessing the purity, seed fill and seed viability of the seed block. So basically you ask questions like, is this a seed? Does the seed contain an embryo? And is the seed alive? And germination testing determines germination potential of a seed lot and also determines what conditions are required for um, germination. So why would you test seeds? Well, ultimately, if seed isn't tested, there could be propagation or restoration failures. So for example, the seed batch doesn't actually contain any seeds. Maybe the seeds are not filled. Um, maybe they're dead. Maybe the germination requirements are unknown. So you sow a whole batch of seeds and nothing comes up. You can also have false assumptions about propagation or restoration conditions. So inadvertently blaming like high temperatures or low rainfall for restoration failure, when in actual fact, perhaps it was the seed lot itself. Certainly a waste of resources like storage space um, and also staff time for re-sowing as well if you um, sow seed batches with poor or unknown quality. Also, it's really important to have quality assurance and value for money so that you don't purchase seed batches of an unknown quality. And you're able to compare two seed lots if you're purchasing from two different suppliers based on the quality. You can also calculate seeding rates both in the nursery and in the field if you've got some of this quality information. Now, firstly, seed purity. Well, seed purity testing determines the proportion of the seed to the non-seed material in the seed lot. So it's really important to identify what a seed is. Uh, so if you just have a look at this little example here of a carimbia, um, this is what kind of comes out when you um, shake all of the material um, out of the carimbia nuts um, or fruits. Um, and then once you sieve it, you can take separate the chaff from the pure seed. So purity, um, of course, can be improved by additional seed processing. So that might be sieves or other types of equipment. And here's just a little infographic to kind of get your head around sort of seed purity assessment. Basically, what you can do is weigh the whole seed batch, weigh the seed only, and then you can work out the purity percentage based on that. Now, seed field testing determines whether or not the, the seed contains an embryo which is basically like the tiny baby plant inside the seed, right? So understanding internal seed morphology, so what the seed, um, the inside of the seed actually looks like really helps. So you might need to know, um, does this particular species have storage reserves? So to, like endosperm, um, or is it an embryo? Um, is it differentiated or undifferentiated? And that means, um, differentiated means, um, has it got, you know, visible cotyledons, the seed leaves, and a visible radical, or is it just kind of, um, like almost, you know, um, one blob of material that's that's not differentiated into root and shoot. Does it have one or two seed leaves or cotyledons? So is it a monocot or a dicot? If you kind of understand a little bit about what you're looking at, it really helps doing seed field testing. So the two types of seed field testing are cut test. Now this is destructive because you're cutting the seed open um, and, and likely to kill it. Um, it is cheap because you pretty much only need a scalpel and perhaps um, a magnifying glass or a microscope, but it is quite time consuming. You can see some examples here, thanks Lorena for these ones, um, that you can see these ones are quite plump, um, they're white and filled. These ones here are also potentially filled because they are, they're white and plump, but you can see over here there's some empty ones that just look like they don't contain an embryo at all. You can also do x-ray analysis. So this is non-destructive, um, so it means you can, doesn't kill a seeds, you can use them again or put them into storage. Um, it can be expensive to buy the desktop um, x-ray analysis, the x-ray unit, however, it's really fast. 
sorry, I'll just hop back to that slide. Um, and so if you have a look at our kind of theoretical um, seed batch here, you can see once you've done this seed fill test, you can understand the proportion of filled seeds to unfilled seeds. So we're getting a little bit clearer on the bit of a picture and what's going on in our seed batch. Now, moving on to seed viability, this tests um, determines whether or not the seeds are alive. Um, and viability is affected by storage conditions. So that's why viability testing is often talked about in terms of um, you know, pre and post storage. Um, you can either do a germination test or a tetrazoleum test to try and find out whether the seeds are alive. But there's limitations with both of these tests. So it sort of depends on, um, depends on the species and depends on the context as to which one you might choose. So one of the limitations with using a germination test as viability test is that although ungerminated, uh, germinated seeds are considered viable, seeds that don't germinate could be incubated at suboptimal conditions or they might be dormant. So they could still be alive, you just may not know. Um, so another method to test seed viability is to use a chemical which stains living tissue in the embryo. So using this technique, Seeds are placed in a colourless solution of tetrazoleum chloride. So through a biochemical process, living tissue here is um, stained red. And so here's some embryos here you can see stained red and some which are possibly not so clear that haven't stained at all. And here's another one of Lorena's photos where you can see that in, in these grass seeds, some of the embryos have stained red um, and some of them haven't. Now here's our theoretical seed batch and you can see we're getting developing a, a bit of a clearer picture. We know that there's some unfilled seeds, some filled seeds, um, some viable and some non-viable. So now moving on to germination testing. Germination testing determines the germination potential of the seed lot, but the seeds require appropriate moisture, temperature, oxygen and light conditions for germination. So these really need to be known in order to do the germination test. Um, but of course you can develop um, an understanding of what is required for germination through various experiments. So there might be reasons why the seeds don't germinate. The seeds could be dead, as we've said before, they're non-viable, or they're not filled, as we've said before, or they could be dormant, or the test conditions provided were not appropriate. And now you can see that um, once we've done a germination test, assuming that we know the correct conditions, we can determine the proportion of germinated seeds to the proportion of dormant. Now these dormant seeds, they're kind of, it's like they're sleeping with one eye open, right? They, they, they know what's going on around them, but they just don't visibly appear to be doing anything. So a dormant seed is one that does not have the capacity to germinate in a specified period of time under physical environmental factors that are otherwise favourable for its germination. And if you understand the dormancy class, this really helps select an approach to alleviate that class of dormancy. And you can get clues for these conditions from the seed's natural environment. So what sort of weather is it like between when the seed is dispersed um, and when the seed would naturally germinate? Is it hot and dry? Is it cold and wet? So these ex situ, is there a fire perhaps? Ex situ treatments include smoke, scarification, stratification, after ripening and chemicals such as gibberellic acid. So putting it all together, here's our kind of theoretical seed batch. So you can see as you go through all of these different tests, you, you can build a better picture about exactly what's in the seed batch through a seed purity, seed fill test, then the viability testing, and then also the germination testing as well. And you can come up with a variety of um, different kind of measures or metrics as well which then you can record in your recording processes. So when should you test? Well, purity and seed fill is probably quite useful to do this often during collection because you want to see to make sure that the seeds are actually mature during collection. Um, or you could do it um, after collection, before you start processing or during processing, just to make sure that um, you're cleaning to as pure as you can to kind of save space um, and also to check to see uh, what the seed fill is like as well. Now, viability and germination testing, um, you could do this before and after storage to make sure that the storage conditions haven't adversely affected the viability, i.e. seeds aren't dying during storage. Um, you might want to do this prior to sale if you're in a commercial nursery or seed store, um, just to make sure that the product that you're selling um, is good quality or at least known quality. Um, and also at the end of the recommended storage time, as Amelia mentioned, there's um, different storage conditions um, are recommended for different times. So if you kind of come to the end of that time, perhaps it's a good time to test. So obviously it really just depends on storage time conditions, end use, as well as known information as well. Who and what? Well, the who, I mean, it could be in-house uh, or it could be outsourced. 
um, if it's in-house, people might require training um, and you can have a look online at the Flora Bank guidelines and there's some training modules surrounding that as well. Um, you might need to get an, ex uh, an external consultant in to do some training as well. There's different level, different types of equipment. Um, something as simple as a magnifier and a scalpel might be sufficient, um, but also having a bit more equipment um, can perhaps make seed testing a little faster and easier as well. But to start up, here's a bit of a list of some sort of basic equipment that you might need. In terms of sampling for testing, it's really important to take a random sample from the whole bag. Don't just scoop it out of the top or take it out of the bottom, because if the seed's been sitting there or it's been mixed around, it might sort itself out according to weight. So you're really important to take a random sample. So first of all, mix the whole seed lot. Take a primary sample, so this sort of random sample of a few spoonfuls or a cup, a few cups, um, and sometimes you can take that from different parts of the bag, or if you've got seed lots spread over multiple bags, take one from each bag. Um, and then once you've bulked that primary sample together, sorry, you can ran randomly extract the number of seeds required for the test. And there's different ways to do this. If you're interested, have a look at the international rules for seed testing. In terms of record keeping, um, the information about the seed lot is also a really important aspect of seed quality. So what, the species name, where, the collection location, and also the collection date as well. And keeping these um, written down and then transferred into an electronic database or spreadsheet is really important. Um, remember to record the test date of any quality testing that you do and label the seed batches. So this seed testing can help inform nursery propagation conditions in terms of what temperature or how long um, you might expect the seeds may germinate over, can be used to calculate seeding rates and also value for money. Thanks very much to the Module 10 authors. Um, please take a look at the Flora Bank guidelines. They are free online. You only just need to log in to be able to download them. You can see that the quality testing module is really integrated into all of these modules um, that support the seed supply chain. And we also have four modules as well that support the whole chain. Thank you very much. Fantastic. That was an excellent summary, Lucy, and a very um, speed speed read through some of those chapters. And just a quick note um, that Bob's put in the comments as well, that purity testing of a batch um, also relates to whether the seed is all that nominated species. So that's um, really important to keep in mind too. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to uh, Meg Hurst, and she's going to talk a bit about contact, content in the germplasm guidelines. Thanks, Meg. Hi everyone, and um, today I just wanted to walk you through the chapter from the Plant Germplasm Guidelines. Um, it's a brisk walk, it's a big chapter, um, and it's also just from the revision of the work that Shane Turner and David um, Merritt did. And so from two authors to 10 contributing authors under a time of COVID, I'm really impressed how this has come together and how Amelia has managed to keep us all running it on time at a time of great uncertainty. Um, I'm talking today from NAM. Um, I'm at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria, and I just wanted to show you basically where I'm located. And I'm in the science division in the Victorian Conservation Seed Bank. Our seed bank is a small team and we work with other staff within science, such as the conservation genetics team, collections, taxonomists, as well as staff from horticulture and nursery to support our conservation work and the roles within our division. And I just really must emphasise that, that to get anything done, we really have a very collaborative approach here. So the chapter, um, to begin the gem plasm guidelines, it's around 54 pages and it covers germination testing, dormancy classifications, how to approach dormancy issues and methods that you can use. There are about five uh, case studies that illustrate particular research methods on germination and ways to break seed dormancy. There's colour images and breakout boxes that summarise key points. There's also a terrific glossary section, so any font that's in bold, uh, you can look up to get the definition and um, I find this really, really super um, helpful. So the typical process um, when carrying out germination testing begins with uh, gathering species specific information. And this can be from literature searches, published protocols, technical information sheets, databases, conference proceedings. There's a lot. 
Um, I just wanted to emphasise uh, up on the Australian Journal, Journal of Botany, uh, David and Shane's paper is a really great example of data and reviews for the recent findings of germination studies on Australian species. And this is with respect to the role of germination and moisture in the control of dormancy and germination. So looking at some of these papers, and I'm going to refer to uh, James Wood as a case study just a bit later. So we're working through um, species and we may be working with species that we're not familiar with. And so therefore it's really good to look at related species and the pea family are a great example here because uh, many taxa have a hard seededness and there's a lot of literature on how to address this. Uh, just down below you'll see um, two images from Shane Turner of untreated acacia seed and then treated acacia seed to um, break that physical dormancy with a one um, minute hot water and, then, and that's where germination has occurred. The other thing is to look at is the seasonal response and um, here's a sample of an indicative alternating seasonal temperature regimes and this is from the Bureau of Meteorology and it's showing the Australian capital cities that could be adopted for assessing germination of species located in proximity to these urban centres. So when selecting germination conditions you need to think about the natural environmental cues as Lucy uh, mentioned um, that stimulate seed to germinate and the conditions and germ dormancy breaking treatments required to overcome seed dormancy and then using climate data to determine optimal germination temperatures. And that can also be done through particular in incubation methods and using thermogradient plates. Understanding a species seed bank type can be really useful. So if you um, if the seed is persistent and so it's it stays on the plant, it's called serotonous. Or if it sheds into the soil seed bank, it's geosporous. And serotonous species store their mature seeds in the plant canopy, as you can see up the top there, the Banksia ornata. And why we want to know that is that the serotonous species store their mature seed and they're usually not dormant because they're released during a period that's conducive to germination, such as fire. And you'll find that in some um, uh, genre in um, Motaceae, Proteaceae, and also in Alacasurina and Casuarina. So these are, and then in, in comparison to those, they're species that release their mature seeds into the soil. So the geosporus, as I mentioned, and these are really common. Um, it's a very common to, uh, type of um, dispersal in um, Australian flora. And these commonly are dormant when they shed. So knowing this, and these are often um, in families, Apiaceae, Asteraceae, Poaceae, um, is really, really important. We also need to determine um, the natural germination unit and uh, Lucy uh, pointed on this as well. So wanting to know um, what constitutes a seed and the features that are found in, in those seeds. Um, and what we have is um, the seed here, you can see um, an example of a true seed with the embryo, the spaculate here, it's quite yellow, um, as opposed to seeds that um, are, also it held in the, um, the true seeds of the embryo and the storage, but then they can also be surrounded. And so to determine the natural germination unit, um, there's seeds that feature fruits that can affect germination characteristics and dormancy types. So seeds and fruits vary immensely and the actual germination unit may not be that obvious. So true, true seeds have an embryo and storage tissue surrounded by a tester, but some seeds are encased and they're protected within. So it's not really that obvious. And you'll find that in uh, some of the image up here, like in grasses. Um, the reason we want to know all this from a tutorial point of view is we're storing seed for long-term um, ex situ conservation. So after a successful seed collection trip, the next steps um, is really looking at how we can get that seed um, dried down to extend its shelf life. We clean it, we remove unnecessary parts, but again, if it's part of that dispersal unit, we, we keep it intact and we assess the quality and viability. We weigh and we look at the different measures. And lastly, um, the database, um, all our, our results, 
and that includes provenance, time of collection, um, the collecting number and so forth. I'm just showing you the x-ray because this is a standard part of our curation process now um, here at the gardens and it really is a powerful tool for assessing the quality of the seed collections and for us it's terrific because we can also use it in our experimental designs now knowing that before we uh, launch into any uh, research experiments we know that the seed is filled before we start so it's a really great quality control but it's also terrific from an experimental point of view. Um, these images here are from Daniel White put together and it really illustrates the application. So you've got images um, that were taken from some recent summer collections that we made. And up the top, uh, there's Acrothamnus hookeri. This is an alpine species that we were looking at. And the five chambers, uh, those that are dark uh, are non-filled and those that are white, the seed is present within. So we can start getting a really good um, idea of um, how much seed we have, and we really can then do percentages on filled seed. And this is really so we can start looking at our seed testing, so we have a better understanding of what we actually are working with. And one of the things that we need to do is determine whether a species has a physical dormancy. Um, and so here uh, we use an inhibition test. Um, Shane Turner's graph um, here shows a Dodone seed and the untreated seed, which is the control, uh, doesn't greatly increase in its seed mass. Uh, so it's indicating a low water uptake, whereas the two treatments for nicking and hot water indicate a rapid increase in greater um, mass, which is basically more than 80%, showing that by um, either nicking or uh, using a hot water treatment, the water inhibition has been able to, water has been able to take uh, uptake and, um, and imbibe. So really a, a good indication that there's a physical dormancy, a, a hard sea coat that needs to um, be broken. So there's methods in the chapter, and if inhibition testing confirms that presence of physical seed dormancy, there's several options uh, for removing that barrier, such as um, uh, Shane's done there with uh, nicking the seed um, coat with a scalpel or using a hot water treatment. Um, there's steps to the basic principles as well, um, and in the guidelines it goes through um, really the basic principles for germination testing and Lydia will go over a step-by-step -step, um, guide through this um, but it's really important to reiterate here that germination requirements uh, can be determined by an integration of one the life form knowing the habitat knowing the climate conditions what type of seed um, the seed type, is it uh, serotonous? Um, and you're putting this all together. So again, getting these species specific information to really complement the work that you're about to go undertake. And then really noting if there is any potential for a seed dormancy that you'll need to address. James Woods put a terrific case study together for setting up um, ongoing germination testing and this is in the Tasmanian Sea Conservation Centre. To the point um, for he's got colour-coded temperature regimes, he's recorded how long-term recording can take place, and also for um, using it with a series of volunteers. So basically being able to train up and use these methods. Uh, it's a really good uh, case study on how best to set up an ongoing system for capturing your germination data. I highly recommend it. So um, as mentioned, not all seed germinates readily and the two most common types of seed dormancy are physical. So that's that seed coat uh, related as we were talking about with those inhibition tests and physiological, which is the embryo related. So physical dormancy describes seeds which possess, as I said, that hard seed coat. Let's just think about the pea family. And physiological dormancy refers to seeds um, in which the embryo possesses a physiological inhibition Inhibiting, me <laughs> inhibiting <laughs> mechanism that prevents radical emergence. And so there, this um, uh, dichotomous key that um, has been put together by Shane, Karen and Lucy 
is another step-by-step -step with visual cues of what to really look for, and it's really helpful. I'm not going to go through all the C classifications now because, as you would probably know, we would be here for some considerable amount of time. But um, just with um, the images that you'll find in the germplasm guidelines, this one is of um, a Petosterum species, Marianus uh, Arab. Bessens, uh, my Latin is is lacking, I must say, uh, but the morphological, the morphophysiological dormancy that you see here, um, up the top we've got um, that. Uh, I'll just see it. So we can see here that um, the embryo has not developed, and it's ta it takes time. Um, so um, the physiological dormancy is this undeveloped embryo and it really needs time to grow before germination can occur. And you can find this in um, Ramnaceae and here in um, Petosporum, Petos the Petosporum family. So here, uh, here's a picture of the beautiful Marianthus, which I, I, I don't know this species, but I would love to grow it. Um, James has put another method together um, to deal with Ramnaceae collections, and he's used um, a really terrific method for heat shock treatments. And uh, again, the step-by-step -step guides um, on the methods that you can go through in the germplasm guidelines to see how people have actually really taken to looking at how to alleviate dormancy across different families. So again, um, just looking at the methods, and I again recommend looking at James Wood's heat shock treatments and applying it in this um, fan-assisted laboratory oven and heating seed samples in aluminium foils and so forth, and then placing them into um, incubators. Another case study um, from the Australian Plant Bank um, from uh, Nathan Emery. He presented a case study on work that was undertaken with Pisunia. And in the lab, retaining that endocarp typically results in no germination at all, but removing 50% can have a significant germination effect. So um, how do you remove it? And this is what um, Nathan talks about and goes through the various treatments um, of how to carefully uh, remove um, the endocarp without damaging the seed. Um, so that's really important, how you can extract that seed and then using mild bleach and so forth, and then trying to um, go through the germination process. Again, another case study that is really worth um, exploring. Shane Turner provides a protocol for seed burial trials and a case study on seed burial experiments. Now, seed burial can involve um, studies of germination ecology in the field and it can be in conjunction with greenhouse um, conditions, controlled greenhouse conditions, and it can really assist in understanding and identifying the cues required to break dormancy. And in particular, these experiments can aid identification of seasonal changes in moisture and temperature that are needed for seeds to germinate. Um, in these types of experiments, seeds are buried and checked regularly uh, to determine viability decline. And some of these um, experiments can actually run for uh, quite a, a long time. I think it's uh, over six years with some of um, Shane's work. So um, the temperature and rainfall are monitored and the germination stimulants uh, can also be used um, to promote germination of the naturally cued uh, seed. So you get this suite of information from um, ex situ and um, also from working within the, within the lab itself. Um, so towards the end of the chapter, we have work on um, uh, smoke for seed germination. And the phylogenetic tree that I've, I've shown here, again from Shane, Karen and Lucy, is showing placement of families that have a physical dormancy um, confirmed in at least one of the species. And um, the location of where that uh, water impermeable barrier might be, so whether it's the sea coat or um, the uh, pericarp. Families with flames next to them um, indicate that at least one species within this family have been recorded um, germinating in situ following a fire. Now, this is really important because again, we've got these species specific information, but then we've got information that um, you might need to say, for example, how to make smoke water. And Dave Merritt really has taken the lead on this with an informative um, section on smoke for seed germination, the equipment required, and a real how-to and step-by-step -step guide to make smoke water. So again, towards the end of the, the chapter. 
I just want to thank you for listening. As I said, it's a, just a quick walk through. There's a lot of information in there. Um, I'd like to thank Began for the opportunity to speak today and feel free to contact me if you wish to. Thank you. Thanks so much, Meg. That was excellent and a, a great job on that chapter. Um, simplifying, yeah, a very complex topic. And if I had to sum it up in one way, I would just say we're thinking like a seed. What is the seed experiencing while it's in the field? Um, we have some great questions in the chat, but we're going to save them to the end. Um, and Lydia is going to um, present the case study put together by herself and Gemma now. Thanks so much, Lydia. Thanks, Amelia. Can you guys all hear me okay? And can you see those slides? Excellent. So thank you very much to BGANS and ANPC and ASBP for the opportunity to be involved in these seminars and also the germplasm guidelines. Um, my name's Lydia. I'm presenting today from Ngunnawal country in Canberra and like to pay my respects to the traditional owners, past, present and emerging. And I'm actually presenting on behalf of my colleague Gemma today. Um, this is work we've been doing together, but she's the one who's done all the hard work getting these slides together, but wasn't able to join today. So um, unfortunately for you, you'll have to hear from me rather than Gemma. But anyway, what we wanted to do to um, finish off the seminar from today is show you how a case study of how we've used germination and viability, viability assessment to work out what to do with seeds that don't germinate. And so we're really interested in germination. We're working in a conservation seed bank and germination is critical to everything that we do because we want to be able to propagate plants from the seeds we store. We want to use germination for our seed-based research that we do in collaboration with various universities and other partners. And we also use germination as our main measure of viability when we're storing collections over time. We periodically retest those to monitor their viability and any potential decline. So germination is really important for all of these different um, aspects of seed banking. And so when we pull seeds out of the bank, we put them through a germination test. And ideally, we want that germination test to achieve a pass Ideally, it would be something like 100% germination for a given batch of seeds. But in our seed bank, we've come to accept that 75% is sufficient. We know in wild species in particular, we see a lot of variation. And so we're happy enough with 75 that that germination is pretty good and we can move on. And that helps us really prioritise where to spend our time and effort because we have... Um, a large and ever-growing co collection. Um, our average is about 300 new collections coming in every year and that's always growing. So we do need to prioritise the, the collections that need the most work. And so if we can't achieve that 75%, then we're in this scenario where we have seeds that are difficult to germinate. And that leads us to ask why. We wonder if the seeds might be non-viable and that's something that we can investigate using tetrazoleum testing. So thanks Lucy for the excellent um, explanation of how that one works. We might wonder whether the seeds are dormant and that's something that we can investigate using dormancy and germination research and Meg's given us a lovely introduction to dormancy and, and some of the ways that um, we can look to the environment for the species has come from to understand what to do in this case. Um, but it might also be that seeds are empty and so x-ray analysis is, is an option there for understanding whether you even had a seed to begin with. Maybe germination is low because some of the what looks like a seed is not actually a seed on the inside. So we, we use all of these methods and together take the information that we gather from them to make informed decisions about what to do with our collections. And the case study that I'm sharing with you comes from the natural temperate grasslands and grassy woodlands that surround us in Canberra and across southeastern Australia. And we're really interested in these because they're critically endangered habitats and they're home to more than 300 native plant species. And in our seed bank, we have more than half of those species stored and that number is always growing. Uh, but because of that conservation value of those habitats, we really wanted to make sure we have the best data possible for the collections we hold of these species. And we wanted to assess the viability and the germinability of our grassy ecosystem collections. And we found that we had 37 accessions where we didn't have this kind of data. So we aimed to test these accessions. We really wanted to be able to award them all a pass or if we couldn't get them to pass and achieve 75% germination, we wanted to understand what the next best step would be to take in managing these collections. So the first thing we did was look to the literature. Um, 
Meg gave some nice examples of um, scientific papers. There's a few more on the screen here that are specific to grassland communities. So we knew there was some work out there that we could look to for advice. And in general, it's been that there were some grassland species that germinate quite readily. They probably didn't have dormancy and they should be able to germinate quite well. So actually the first step we took was to expose seeds to what we just called control conditions. We had multiple replicates of 25 seeds and we just used a plain water agar medium and put those seeds into a temperature regime that mimicked the temperature the seeds would encounter after dispersal in these grassland habitats. And we gave them an alternating light and dark so that light was available. So there's no pre-treatment involved here. It's really just a screen to see whether we can get germination. And we found for our 37 accessions, which you see across the x-axis on the bottom, that germination, which is on the y-axis, um, germination varied a lot. And we had eight accessions that straight out achieved a pass, but it was only eight. And we were left with the remainder where we weren't sure whether those seeds were dead, dormant or empty. And we looked to investigate germination further in this case for the ones that might be dormant or need other um, germination cues. We looked at fire related pretreatments. Other work from our lab in the past couple of years has shown that a lot of the grassland species do also respond to fire. So we tested smoke water, smoke water and heat in combination and hot water on its own. We also investigated the viability. We used those tetrazoleum tests and tried to, um, well, we applied that to our species and looked for these nice bright red embryos that you can see in the middle of the um, slide there. And that was the indicator of, of a viable seed. And finally, we looked at seed fill. We used the X-ray methods and nice white bright um, filled seeds show up quite well on those x-ray images whereas those that are a bit grey or empty looking are the seeds that are not filled. And so in our case we only use the x-ray for a few collections where germination was really low and from cut tests after germination or from the tetrazoleum testing we knew that we had quite a lot of empty seeds and so we wanted to quantify that portion understand that seed fill and see whether we could better um, clean and manage those collections. Once we had all of our data together, it was time to do some data analysis. And so this is just a little screenshot of a page out of chapter seven that Meg has talked about. You can go there to find out some um, pointers on the kinds of analysis that can be used for seed related data. Um, it's worth saying, I guess, that for any analysis, you want to really look at your own data first and determine what's the best um, suited to the data that you have, the structure it has and, and the characteristics of it. But there are some pointers here that are pretty kind of general to seed data that you can follow. And so, for example, um, if you were looking like we were to compare tetrazoleum results with germination results, something like a chi-squared test might be relevant and that allows you to compare two samples or two results. That also could be relevant if you've got, say, a collection where there's an old germination test and a newer one that you've done and you want to see if there's a difference in viability over time, or it might be relevant if you have a control and some sort of treatment that you've applied and you want to compare the two. We also knew for our fire treatments that we were going to be looking at controls and comparing them to multiple different treatments with our smoke and heat and smoke and heat combined. And so something like generalised linear models were probably going to be a good fit there. So we did go ahead, um, look at our data, determined that chi-squared tests were going to work for us in a lot of the cases and that we'd need to do some generalised linear models for looking at our fire cues. And so we're writing this up at the moment. So it's very much a work in progress, which is why I've put a little um, don't share up there, but hopefully the paper will be out soon and we'll be able to share that with everybody. These are the germination results that we found for the fire treatments that we tried. So some of the collections, um, each little box here is a collection. The bar in the kind of salmony colour to the left is the control. And you can see that some of those didn't achieve the 75% um, threshold that we were aiming to achieve. But when we added a treatment, for example, smoke and heat, we were able to increase the germination beyond that 75% and achieve our pass. So these five cues allowed us to get another five collections up to the pass stage. One of the collections doubles up here, which is why you see six passes on the screen. Um, from our seed fill investigations for the accessions that were not looking too um, 
too high a fill, we found that four out of five of our collections could really benefit from recleaning, going back through processing and being improved so that we had a greater um, amount of, of viable filled seed. And so finally, what I want to finish on is taking you through how we used the com combination of the germination data, either from, well, basically any germination data, either our one from control or our one with fire cues. We just used the best germination we could get for a collection and compared that with the tetrazoleum test, the viability result. And so what we came up with when we compared those two things are five next steps for our collection management. And so don't worry about reading everything in that table there. We'll step through each of the five steps now. And the first one is where our tests, our germination test and our tetrazoleum test were statistically not significantly different. So any seed that was viable in the tetrazoleum results a similar number germinated in the germination results. So this told us that even though germination might have been low, actually anything that was viable did germinate. So this was a case where we could award a viability adjusted pass and that allowed four more collections to go into that pass category once we gave them this viability adjusted pass. It means we can rebank those seeds, we can use them, we know the protocol to get as much, uh, high as germination as possible for that collection. Second step or the second category was one where when we compared the germination and the tetrazoleum results, we achieved a near pass. So here there was statistically almost no difference between viability and germination, but our confidence interval was quite broad. There's a bit of uncertainty here. And so here we have determined the next step for us will be to repeat germination and tetrazoleum testing, but use more seeds, increase our replication or our number of seeds to give us a bit more statistical power to get a better result or a more um, confident result here so that we can then take the next best, best action. The third group or the third category was where from germination and tetrazoleum tests, we found that germination was underestimated. So in this case, the viability results from the tetrazoleum tests were higher, significantly higher than the germination that we achieved. And so we know absolutely for sure in this case, dormancy is at play and we need to do further research to look at the germination and dormancy of those collections. So that was um, really useful for us because if you think back to the initial, the first graph of all the uh, 37 accessions and only eight had passed, we could have just assumed that the rest, it was dormancy, which is a really common thing to do. Um, but actually we've found once we rule out viability and fill and some of these other characters, it's actually only 11 collections that really warrant that investigation and further research. And so we can really prioritise our effort into those 11 collections and do research on those. Our um, fourth category was where we got low results, unfortunately, for both the tetrazoleum and the germination test. So sometimes, you know, you don't quite get what you were hoping for and we weren't, they, the results just weren't good enough here to do any analysis. So here, our next action for these three collections is to validate the test results and try to improve the methodology, see if we can get some better results. So with the tetrazoleum testing, it might be that we need to dissect the seeds in a different way. It's a bit species specific, so there's possibly some troubleshooting there in how we dissect the seeds or how long we expose them to the stain. Or in the germination testing, it could be that we need some different pretreatments or we've used the wrong temperatures. So we can troubleshoot those conditions and see if we can improve results to um, a uh, amount that's um, useful for analysis. And finally, the last step, these were ones where um, we had three collections where we didn't hit our 75% pass. And unfortunately, we just didn't have enough seed to do any further work with these. So we didn't want to exhaust the complete conservation collection. So in this case, we've rebanked what was left so that there's at least something remaining in the bank, but we've prioritised recollecting and our collecting team will be looking for more collections of these um, species, particularly if we don't have too many more in the bank at the moment. So that really helps inform our collection program as well so that we can do further research. So I guess in summary, um, we, if we think back to the um, ultimate goals of seed banking, we really want to be able to um, take seeds out of the bank and use them and have reliable germination that we kind of expect and know what we're going to get out of those seeds and these methods of using germination testing and viability testing and understanding the seed quality are all really useful for um, improving those results and in particular 
directing all of our effort and resources into the places where dormant viable seeds are are there and we know that we're working on those and not accidentally just looking at something that might be dead or empty or, or not really a seed. So it's really helpful methodology for um, prioritising curation actions and we hope that those five steps also help other seed banks out there when you, um, you, know, you do all these tests, you have the data, you make the comparisons, but it's not always immediately clear what next. So we hope that that's kind of a helpful structure for working out what next given the results that you get. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share that example. Um, I'll thank our funders and collaborators who are on the left of the slide there. If you have any questions um, you want to follow up further, feel free to contact Gemma. Her email's just up there in the slide and keep an eye out for the paper, which we hope to come, will come out soon. Thanks so much for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Lydia. And, and thanks, um, Lydia, Lucy and Meg today. I think um, all of those presentations really emphasise for me how important it is um, knowing what you've got and how best to use it. So it might look like a handful of seeds, but really, you know, they could be empty, um, they could be yeah, non-viable, they could be dormant. So yeah, what you see is not always what you get. So it's great to um, understand how to do a bit more investigation of what's there. Um, so I know we have time for some questions now, and there is one in the um, chat from Jo Brennan. Um, so Lydia, I might throw it to you to start with. She's asking, does X-raying cause any damage to the seed? So great question Joe, and it's one that um, we do get asked a lot and I think Amelia's popped a great answer in the chat about um, the way that we manage the collections that we have x-rayed so we tend to use a subsample of the seed for that x-ray test and then as conservation seed banks we'll generally put that aside we'll still um, treat it in the same way as the rest of the collection but keep it separate and not mix it back in just on the off chance that there has been some damage but the research that's been done tends to show that the seeds aren't visibly damaged. We haven't really seen any evidence of um, damage that relates in that, that results in any um, phenotypic changes. It doesn't seem to result in genetic changes. I think it is a bit of a, a um, active area of research, but certainly um, it, it is a good tool for uh, not not destruct. Oh, sorry, not a non-destructive measure of seed fill, and one that. Um, you know, it's a very low intensity X-ray. It's a very quick X-ray. It shouldn't do any damage, but I guess we just take the precautionary principle and we put those aside separately so that we only use them if we really have to until we know more. Yeah, fantastic. That's really helpful. Thanks, Lydia. Um, and Lucy, there's also a question here um, about where people who are germinating native seed for botanic gardens, where they can access test results. Did you want to say a little bit um, about the flora bank resources and then Damien's also popped an excellent resource in the chat too um, about the Australian Seed Bank partnership um, where their data goes and the update that's planned for those um, for that resource. Sure that's a really good question and that is also something we get asked quite a lot and it's really irritating that there isn't a national guidelines on how to do seed based propagation because you know everything's so species specific um, and there's also very location specific. So I know that there are some really great resources for um, particular ecosystems. So sometimes books have been written around particular places. Um, and so if you're lucky enough to be in one of those places, then um, try and seek out one of those, you know, propagation books if you can. Um, so that would be a first step. Um, the Flora Bank Guidelines has online resources um, at the end of many of the chapters. So you can go through and have a look um, at some of those. So um, yeah, so seed information databases, germination databases. Um, yes, like Amelia said, um, you know, Damien and the others are putting one together for that's national, but also state-based botanic gardens um, often have them as well. So depending on your state, go to your state botanic gardens website and see if you can find one if they have one. Um, um, and I think um, also there's other ways to, I've put in the chat as well that you can ask on the Flora Bank forum as well. There's like a chat group there so you can you can start. But basically, if you don't know where to start, um, have a look at the temperature and moisture, the temperature conditions at the time in which the seeds would likely germinate. So, for example, in Perth, um, they're likely to germinate. Um, in our um, autumn, which is not a particularly good kind of <laughs> season. Um, like it's not a good explanation of what the type of season is. But basically, um, you know, you probably start at about 18 degrees Celsius and you might start with light and dark. Um, 
or you might just start with light and see what happens. Um, that that would be my first, you know, first place to start. Um, so, I mean, obviously, if you're doing germination testing for a range of species across a whole state or um, many ecosystems, that can be problematic. So small germination cabinets can be really helpful to, um, you know, control different germination temperatures as well. So thanks for the great question. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. And I think if you don't have um, those controlled germination conditions available to you, just looking at the conditions where you are and trying to align that with the time of year when the seeds would naturally be dispersed. And so you can expose them, you know, environmentally to, to the conditions at that time of year as well. Um, and I think as well, if you've done some basic investigation and had a look at the germplasm and the flora bank guidelines and you're really stuck on where to go next, um, there's lots of people in the author lists and in the reference list at the end of the chapter. And I know those people are always more than happy to talk about germination and problem solving and things like that. So feel free to get in touch with those, those people um, as well. Yeah. I just wanted to add James Wood's database uh, for the Tasmanian Sea Bank is amazing and he you can email James and talk to James. He is just an absolute wealth of information and incredibly generous with his knowledge. Yeah, that's true, Meg. And I think too, like I know it never gets old seeing seeds germinate and we're we're more than happy to talk about it for a long time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and do we have any last questions before we wrap up? No? Okay. Well, I was also going to um, mention as well, um, breaking news, there'll, there'll be a germplasm um, symposium at the Global Botanic Gardens Congress coming up um, in September, which um, is another place that you can get together and chat with people who are doing um, similar work at Botanic Gardens all around the world, which is amazing. We've got so much we can learn from each other. Um, and I note the closing date for some of the um, bursary scholarships available, um, particularly in Victoria, are closing tomorrow. So last chance to get writing those applications as well. Um, and I've just popped the um, website for that, um, that Congress in the chat there. And I'll hand over to you, Emma. Oh, thanks, Amelia. And thank you again to all our amazing speakers. I know if I had seed stuff in my role, I'd definitely want to do that, but there's too many other things to juggle. Um, so I just want to wrap up uh, by letting you know that the July uh, Become Plant Forum will, uh, theme will be on tree management. So we have two great speakers, uh, Ian Allen from Mount Toma, the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens, and Toby Chapman from Christchurch uh, City Council, both talking about how they kind of manage their tree collections and the, the tools and the things that they use. Um, and we will also have a demo from Iris BG around their tree management module. So if you are a user of Iris or interested in being a user of Iris, you might like to come along. Um, if you have specific questions about how to use Iris for tree management, please send them to me. Um, I will put my email in the chat um, and I will send those over to Iris so that it can kind of incorporate your questions into the demo. Um, and other than that, it was amazing having you all here and I look forward to seeing you all in our next uh, plant forum. Thanks so much. Thanks Emma. All. See ya. See ya, thank you.